Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here tonight with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? Fantastic. Well, a little sore. I played hockey last night. And, yeah. and every time I play hockey the next day, I'm sore. <laughs> That's all I got to say about that. Tough our, game, David. It is a tough game, Bruce. It is a tough game. I remember that when they did that feature on Connor McDavid's house mm-hmm. um, that his wife designed. And um, I can't remember if he was showing it off or she was showing it off. But anyway, they showed the tub where McDavid, it was his favorite place in the house. And I can just imagine after getting beaten, bruised up, him lying in a big bucket of a tub of this ice. Like it was the biggest, deepest tub I think I've ever seen. And I could see, just picture McDavid sitting there with all his aches and pains after yeah. after every game. Wish, yeah. I a, wish I had a tub like that. His all girl, right. His, his girlfriend, isn't it still? Like, yeah. Girlfriend. Common law, probably. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they certainly... My mom used to call him Puzzle Q, person of opposite sex sharing living quarters. P O S S L Q. Puzzle Q. She was in the L B T G Q plus. uh, No, no, this is Puzzle Q was way before that other one. Way before. before. (laughs) That's from like the 30s. Really? Bruce. Two good things, two bad things, two numbers in Edmonton's 6-3 victory over the Senators of Ottawa. All right, Mm -hmm. we'll go with two good things each. What's your first good thing? Sure, Uh, i got to go with the way Edmonton opens the scoring in this game. Loved it. Uh, And they they didn't have the greatest first period, let's face it, but uh, they sure started the game well on a beautiful four-way passing play from four players that you wouldn't really expect. Uh, These being sort of near the bottom of the roster players and the quality of this game of this goal uh, was off the charts for, you know, generally for for uh, bottom tier players, but uh, just a beautiful goal. And actually all started with the goal scorer, Derek Ryan, doing a great job on the back check because Ottawa came out of their Mm -hmm. own zone. They tried to chip it up the boards and Ryan uh, disrupted the pass. And so it kind of came loose as a 50-50 puck, uh, just as it got to Edmonton's blue line. And from there, uh, Vincent Deharnay and his enormous reach was able to uh, pull the puck in uh, and just make a, a, a quick, smart pass into open ice in, in uh, through the neutral zone. And that's where Devin Shore was. Shore was kind of on his backhand as he took the pass, but he made a real good uh, uh, head man play too. Ryan McLeod, and Ryan McLeod and Derek Ryan hit the blue line just perfect. It was onside. I had to go back and look at it. I thought they might even yeah, hit that one. Wondering. It was close. And then uh, McLeod threaded a, a real nice pass through, and Derek Ryan absolutely buried it under the crossbar. Hit some kind of iron on its way in. I'm not sure if it was post in or bar down, but it was right up in the in the corner. Perfect shot. And what a way to open the scoring and that's uh, his 12th goal of the season now for Derek Ryan. That's a pretty decent production for a, uh, uh, you know, million and a quarter dollar, uh, million, $1.25 million cap hit player. Uh, you know, he's covered the bet and then some, because he does a lot more things than score goals, but he does score them. And, uh, 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 with more frequency than you might expect from that far down the lineup. Top shelf, Bruce, where Mama keeps the cookies. Mm-hmm. That was a beautiful shot. It was that was just a fantastic shot, mm-hmm. um, and fantastic skill all the way through there. You know that was a nice pass by Devin Shore. Very yes. nice pass by Devin Shore. All nice passes. Very nice pass by Ryan McLeod. Yeah, they were all nice passes. Darnay Dar- too. Darnay made a nice won a nice battle there to start it off. But, but yeah, that shot by Ryan was fantastic. Um. Yeah, Bruce, uh, my good thing will be the two uh, executioner shots that went in. And I'm not sure exactly how many Edmonton Oilers are now executing the executioner shot. It's essentially where you go down to one knee to get off the one-timer and kind of lash the puck at the net. Mm -hmm. But I know Fogel's done it. And now uh, this is the first time that I can recall Nugent Hopkins doing it. 
he pounded that puck in a la Leon Dreisaitl. And uh, it was on a power play in the second period. And um, the puck was kind of uh, Dreisaitl. It had gone off Dreisaitl's backside to keep it in. Ottawa tried to clear it and it hit Leon. And he he picked up the puck. He shot it and it. it was bouncing around. <clears throat> Kane had it a little bit. And anyway, the Ottawa player slammed it over to, to Nugent Hopkins trying to clear it. And Nuge just took that as a one-timer pass and slammed that puck in the net. And... Um, it was a th- that that goal was a thing of beauty. Um, <clears throat> followed up by the shot was the, the the pass from was it Dylan Gambrell or maybe Travis Hamonic that put it right on Nuge's stick that he hammered it in. But uh, I can remember uh, Louis saying it was Hamonic, but I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, it was one of those guys trying trying to desperately to clear the slot, and they instead kind of chopped it right to Nuge and he buried it as if it had been a tape to tape feed from Leon himself, you know, just boom. He didn't waste any time at all. How did he hammer that puck? Mm-hmm. Do you, re- do you recall anyone else on the Oilers getting off? Because Fogel's done it maybe twice yeah. now. And that's, I was wondering if, because I was thinking there might've been a third player who's shot the puck like that at least once this year. Anyway, I wonder if, if they're, if Leon's giving, you know, Little uh, side business, teaching the other players mm-hmm. the shot after practice. He himself, Bruce, um, with 3.43 left in the second period, um, it was another really nice goal, actually. Evan Bouchard kept the puck in at the point and then uh, went down the boards and Fogel, <laughs> excuse me, Fogel uh, won the puck again, put it over to McDavid, who immediately spotted dry settle in the, in the high slot and made the old low-high pass to Leon, who harpooned it in the net. Just a fantastic shot from Leon, you know, just so quickly off his stick. And um, as I've mentioned previously, he's he's had actually had a hard time in more recent years getting off that uh, one-timer shot at even strength because other teams are looking for it. And when you have five players on the ice, it's that much easier to contain uh, than it is on the power play where he still regularly is able to um, fire such shots, shots at net. But he, he got it here and... Voila, he got his 100th point of the season on that absolutely fantastic shot. Yeah, yeah, he uh, he's the, certainly the master of, uh, in these parts of that type of shot. I mean, it's kind of like the OV shot, but it's not the same. He, he's generally no. lower to the, um, uh, in the zone, like at bottom of the circle, whereas OV, he just kind of owns that entire left circle, right? with his right hand wicked shot. And Drysaddle tends to go a little lower in the zone, but when you're right, when the puck does come over, he tends to get down real low and even drop to a knee and sort of just get all of his strength behind the shot and and, uh, rip it home with frequency. It is, it it may go down in history yet as the most famous one-timer in Edmonton Oilers history, but there's a stiff competition for that title with Yari Curry. Bruce, what is your second good thing? Yeah, well, my second good thing is Leon himself. Uh, As you say, he got to 100 points. He was uh, deservedly the first star in this game. He came out uh, uh, looking strong right from from the outset of this game. Uh, Two goals, uh, including his 100th point, as you say, including the game-winning goal, which I think is his 10th. And yeah, they haven't updated uh, NHL.com yet for tonight. That was his 10th, breaking a, f- a four-way tie with Mikko Ranton and Connor McDavid and Braden Point among the league leaders in, in that uh, obscure category. A lot of people don't value game winners anymore, but I still do. I'm, a, I'm old school. I value all stats. Uh, anyway, um, that was... Um, uh, just part, he had an excellent night of even strength. This was great to see. Uh, yes, he did. Where um, uh, he scored, uh, uh, he scored one brilliant goal on uh, uh, at evens. Uh, he just dominated. Uh, like his numbers in this game, like this almost should be my numbers, but I'm just going to give them anyway. Twenty-one to six in shot attempts. This is five on five. Eleven to four in shots. Uh, 15 to three in scoring chances, the version of natural stat trick, six to two in high danger, and uh, two to zero in actual goals. 
And then his sort of regular personal stats from the event summary, we had uh, two goals, plus two, 20 minutes, 14 seconds, six shots on net, 10 shot attempts, a hit, and that was a wicked hit, uh, one giveaway and two takeaways, and 16 out of 23 for a cool 70% on the dot. Like, that's a great set of numbers all the way across both of those sheets, the... Uh, uh, the on-ice stats and the individual stats. And uh, he just had a major impact on this game and scored that milestone. I mean, it's now his fourth 100-point season, so it's kind of expected anymore. But it's always nice to hit that triple digits, you know, and, and uh, to have it be the game winner, so much the better. And I just thought it was uh, for all around good game. I mean, some people might look at the, at the end zone replay of the shorthanded goal Edmonton gave up we'll talk about more in a minute and notice Leon coasting back but he had absolutely zero chance to get back in no, that play that's not so his he fault. just watched it from a distance he was like the the third um uh defensive back watching the guy running into the end zone you know the closest guy might take a futile dive at his feet but <laughs> the guy 15 yards back you know there's just no point at a certain stage so anyway uh you'd, Pretty you'd sure. have to be you, you, you'd have to real, really be a nitpicker to pick that one out of his performance in this game. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that uh, he came on the ice for Evander Kane, I think. And Kane was late getting oh, off. Oh, that one, really yeah. Line change. And, um, Kane I think caught it, him off. <laughs> yeah, and I don't know. Either Leon was coming on for Kane or Kane cut him off. Leon, That was not Leon's fault. That was Evander Kane's fault for making a bad line change, which led mm-hmm. to kind of a three-on-two rush. Um, which was mainly on Kane. Uh, yeah, one one. Right? Yeah, Le- Leon also he led the Oilers with seven major contributions to Grade A shots. He made not not one major mistake on a Grade A shot against this game. So it was I, I gave him an eight out of ten. I thought it was a, a great game. And uh, <clears throat> the other player I gave an eight to was Warren Fogle. Mm-hmm. It was my second. Right on. Uh, <clears throat> good thing it was probably his best game of the year. Um, on Dreisaitl's first goal, he just charged up the puck in McDavid-esque form, <laughs> dodging around people, although he got the puck uh, poked off his stick in the offensive zone, unlike McDavid uh, uh, most often. But um, he uh, Nugent Hopkins then won the puck back, put it over to Dreisaitl, Dreisaitl put it to Fogel, and Fogel put it to uh, Dreisaitl in the slot for the goal. It was, uh, it was Fogel um, was flying out there. Right. He... He um, he got put out um, after a penalty kill in the second period with McDavid and Drysaddle for that power forward power sh- line shift mm-hmm. um, where you try to get your best players on the ice to get a goal and um, he rewarded his coach's confidence in him by making a nice play on Drysaddle's uh, second mm-hmm. goal of the game the uh, the executioner shot we've already talked about so Bruce he's, he's really been coming on. In the calendar year of 2023, his uh, performance at yeah. two-way, Fogel's performance as a two-way player has been outstanding uh, in this calendar year. Good. And it, I wouldn't be surprised if we see that. I think we'll see this line again. I mean, they, that that line was just going at even strength, and the orders need Leon Dreisaitl to be going at even strength. It hasn't happened this year consistently. It's happened more in the last two weeks. And pr- as much mm-hmm. in the last two weeks as it happened in all the rest of the games all year, where Leon's really been going at even strength. And I think it's because he's healthy. Uh, and now he's got, you know, the dynamite line hasn't worked. Yamamoto's been off. I don't know. You know, he's been injured uh, for much of the year, uh, you know, in and out of the lineup. And he's never, Keller Yamamoto has never really found his game um, this year. He's not clicking. And that line really isn't clicking with him on it with Nugent Hopkins and Drysaddle. They've been using the dynamite line quite a bit, but it hasn't worked that well. Um, this line, though, um, might have more potential. Fogel's a much bigger player, obviously, than Yamamoto. And in the playoffs, he, he and Drysaddle could be quite a load, you know, and then working with Nugent Hopkins, who's become quite a tenacious and aggressive player in his own right. So I wouldn't be surprised. Mm-hmm. Um, if we see Fogel work his way into the top six for the playoffs, I think it's a real possibility um, with, you know, you'd have McDavid with maybe Kane and Hyman then on the other line. 
So, <clears throat> you know, and Kane also hasn't found his game. So the Oilers, Agreed. you know, they need to find two lines at the top that work. They've yet to find that. They've got the players, but they've got to get the right mm-hmm. combination still. And they're still working at that. But tonight was a... Um, an indication that maybe uh, it's going to it's going to happen for Fogel, which is a nice thing, right? Because he came here, he was traded for a fan favorite in Ethan Bear. There was many people who were um, discouraged by that trade, who really were huge Ethan Bear fans, and um, didn't like to see him him leave Edmonton. Um, Fogel, uh, he was okay last year. But he didn't. He faded in the, in the playoffs. He didn't play that much. He got benched for some games. <clears throat> this year started out the same way. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he's on this three-year, two point seven five million dollar contract. He was getting heat for how much money he's making, not you know underperforming. But he's given them full value in, and more. This is the player they probably hoped. You know, yeah. fingers crossed they would get. Uh, you know, a young, you know, a power forward in mid-career kind of player. And um, that's what Fogel's been this calendar year. He's he has been that. He's been he's been really strong. So uh, I'm I'm glad to see, I'm very glad you know as an Oilers fan I'm very glad to see that and just for him too because it's nice to see him have success in Edmonton. It's not everybody who who turns it around, right? Some people like right. Eric, Eric Cole just popped into my head. You know, somebody came to Edmonton and never really got it going. Oh. And there's lots of players like that. Scott Mellon, yeah. the players who have had success in other cities. You know, like. You go down the list. There's there's many of those players. They just don't do much here. So um, Joffrey Lupo. Remember Eric Cole. Let's bring him in and put him on his wrong wing. <laughs> you know, it was it was his natural wing, but he's yeah. he scored most of his goals by being a left shot coming in off the right side and making a power move into the net. And the owners had enough right wing, so they just thought, oh well, he'll play left wing then, no problem. And it doesn't always work so well. And he, he never really got comfortable here. But uh, Warren Fogel has gotten comfortable. And I agree with you. It's good to see. I mean, he was all year long. He was in the class of three forwards. Of course, there are also a couple of demon in this group. Three million dollar players with Yamamoto, Pugliarvi and uh, Fogel. And it was inevitable. And eventually it did actually happen that one of them would be traded. And Fogel was on the lot of the people's I hope he's the one who gets traded list. Not that they necessarily hated him, but they like the other two guys better. But Fogel actually it makes the least of the three. And at this point, I don't think it can be deniable that he had the best season, 2022-23 season, out of those three guys. And it's not particularly close. He's been he's been an effective uh, player and, and you know an impact player in a lot of games, uh, Fogel. And this was another one. I mean, that rush he made that eventually did lead to the goal. And then the pass he made at the end of the play after he almost went 200 feet on the rush. He started literally behind his own net, came all the way down. The last guy barely stopped him. And then in the chaos that followed, Drysaddle fed him the puck and he fed it right back and Leon popped it home. And just a couple of real, real uh, nice plays in rapid succession there and rewarded with, uh, you know, the, the goal horn. So... One final bit of trivia about Eric Cole. Oh, yeah. One of the phrases, one of the phrases we use at the Cult of Hockey is the red light zone. Mm-hmm. This is when a player is kind of wandering around his own end when a goal against is scored, and mm-hmm. he's neither covering a passing or shooting lane or covering anybody. He's wandering in the red light zone, mm-hmm. and that that I came up with that phrase watching Yanni Pitkin and play defense for the Edmonton oh, Oilers. Yeah. He was in the red light zone all, so often. That guy was at least in Edmonton. He just came across as somewhat clueless in, in terms of defensive hockey. Yeah, and he was traded for Eric Cole uh, yeah. to the Carolina Hurricanes. So, yeah. anyway. Uh, yeah. Bruce, what is your bad thing? Yeah, uh, I'm going to go with the 2-2 goal, which was the shorthanded goal allowed at the end of the first period. It's 2-1, and and, uh, and Jack, the prognosticator, is saying... Uh, this would be really big for uh, Ottawa to kill it and kind of get away with this period just down a goal. And I'm sort of thinking to myself, geez, I hope they don't score a shorty. <laughs> and anyway, they scored a shorty uh, to, uh, to to ruin the story. But uh, uh, I just the power play was so out of sync. And they had three different shots at the... Um, 
Ottawa net, and none of them got through. They had one. One was uh, one was by Bouchard from the high slot. He looked off McDavid. He tried to sift a shot through. It might have been tipped by Drysaddle. It got blocked in front. Got cleared out of the zone. And then the second time they had trouble sort of gaining the zone because they weren't very coordinated. And the third time, it came to Bouchard again, and he kind of walked into the very high slot. Again, looked off McDavid. I'd be interested to hear the conversation on the bench after this all came down at the end. And from the high, not a terrible position. Like I gave him a blast on Twitter a little bit. And uh, I looked at it again. And he was a little closer to the net than I realized. But the fact remains that he needed to get that shot through and on net, right? On the power play, you don't have a partner on the blue line, right? It's... One guy down low, three across the middle, one guy high. And if that puck doesn't get through, you're in trouble. Well, he did get it through and it hit the end boards, but all of the all of the forwards were kind of caught flat-footed and Nuge got beat coming out of the corner and all of a sudden it's a two-on-one coming the other way with Bouchard, the only guy back. And he, you know, he did his best. He got beat by the pass and it was a tap-in for an easy goal and uh, just a little bit of blue language in Shea McCurdy after uh, the whole sequence was brutal. And uh, Bush, I mean, he's not Tyson Berry, and we can't expect him to be Tyson Berry, but he, some of the things he needs to tailor some of his decisions around what worked for Tyson Berry. And a lot of that wasn't looking off Connor McDavid so that he could fire his own shot, you know. And if you're going to fire the shot, fine. And later on, he, he had a similar situation where Ottawa almost gave him the shot from the high slot. There was nobody contesting, no stick in the lane, which was his problem on the first one, and he ripped a good shot off the post. And that's a great weapon to have, and it's nice to change it up once in a while, but it's not going to be the feature item on this power play because you want the 30% shot of Leon Dreisaitl or the 25% shot of Connor McDavid rather than the 10% shot of the point man, you know. So to keep the play alive and set up the really de- deadly ones is a uh, is a ticket for me. So I, I just I didn't like the offensive sequence and I didn't frankly like the the way the forwards um, you know they were just completely out of the play and all caught flat footed and it uh, was Nuge probably who made the main mistake there. But it uh, it was a pretty wide open two on one for what used to be an Edmonton power play. Yeah, Nuge cr- crept in. He didn't really. Well, he thought he could win the puck, and he just made the he made a bad call. Like he's not thinking like a defenseman, right? He right. thought he essentially made a bad pinch. If mm-hmm. if Nuge doesn't pinch, if he hangs back, there's no goal on that Probably. play. It's, it's the truth. It's a two on two, and you know Bush did get the shot through, didn't he? I mean, if it hits the board, so. But I I, yeah, I did I got think through I, the yeah, it didn't hit the. I, I I did think that um um he this was the first time I thought he looked a little nervous on the power play tonight. Little, I, it was out of sync because of him, and it was because of I thought, of, I thought because of his nerves, mm-hmm. and uh, I think that's to, you know that's going to happen for a young player running this vaunted power play. He's done mm-hmm. a pretty good job of it so far. It's hanging in there. It's getting the odd goal. Um, it's, you know, I don't know what the rate of scoring is. I haven't checked since he's taken mm-hmm. over, but it's it's doing okay. But um, I, he he didn't look like he was in sync with his teammates tonight. He looked like he was his his passes were a little off. They weren't very clever. They weren't very deceptive. Um, he did ring the one shot off the post, but other than that, he wasn't he wasn't great on the power play. And it was the main reason the power. He, there was once when the puck got passed back to him and it hopped over his stick. And you know they that's probably where the bad that's probably where the nerves started, right? Like you screw up like that, you're on the power play and and you make a mistake like that, and and you're just waiting for Michael Jordan to come yell at you. And uh, I don't know if the Oilers superstars do what Michael Jordan did to his teammates, but maybe maybe there's a bit of that um, on any uh, high-powered team. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, uh, that play, uh, it uh, uh, they took that power play off, the first unit off, even though there was like a minute 10 to go. And yeah. The second unit is shot. And then they put the first unit out before the period is over. And again, the puck comes back to Bouchard, and this time he takes a a slap shot and he drills Connor McDavid in the foot. <laughs> so that's probably another reason he's like he's just uh-huh. getting more and more nervous. He first he uh, uh, first he muffs the puck at the point that he drills uh-huh. he drills McDavid. You're right. Yeah, I had that, a, that, 
a guy tweet me after that, and he said I had Bouchard at over. The over under on Bouchard was two point five shots on net, and he said I took him on the over, and he said I would have had the bet already if he hadn't missed the net twice and, and uh, drilled McDavid with the other one. <laughs> yeah, maybe he would. Anyway. He also had an absolutely horrendous, egregious, dreadful turnover with three minutes to oh, go yeah. in the third period and a two-goal Ooh. lead right across the middle of his own oh, zone, God. right under right the box. tape of the guy to walk in alone. Yeah. And then uh, after Skinner stopped that one, uh, subsequently Ottawa regained possession. They passed it right through Bouchard's lane, right onto the tape of another guy who got a great shot, and, and Skinner saved his bacon again. Uh, and I tweeted for the second time all game probably that uh, Bouchard owes Skinner two beers after that sequence because he was uh, uh, he was out to lunch. Uh, there's no real polite way to put it. And I don't think he ever saw the ice again after that. There was only like three minutes left, and they were started mixing the pairs to defend the uh, to defend the lead. So yeah, fortunately the game was well in hand by then. It- but uh, and it didn't yes. end up in a goal, so, so he wasn't. He didn't get the. He won't be getting the Ryan McLeod treatment for that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But people, people who don't like. But Bouchard, it was the same. People, it was the same, same play, and people who don't like Bouchard have lots of ammunition tonight. Mm-hmm. He did make some good plays, though. Yeah. You know. Oh sure, he always does. Yeah. Yeah, he and did. People, I mean, maybe it's me in this podcast because there's three or four negative plays. I did mention he had the good shot off the post. But all these guys have good plays and bad. And so, sometimes like one of my pet peeves is focusing only on the bad. But a uh, uh, equal and opposite pet peeve is focusing only on the good and pretending the bad never happens to a favorite player. And they all have kind of, you know, peaks and valleys. And obviously the peaks are higher. Uh for some than for others, but uh, none of them's perfect, and none of them's none of them's truly terrible either. He we mentioned his nice play, I think, on the boards there on um, Drysdale's second goal. Mm-hmm. His second yeah. even strength goal. You bet. Okay, my bad thing. Though I I didn't find a lot of bad things. I didn't like the way the orders kept uh, kind of a looked like a fairly mediocre, uninspired Ottawa team. Tired, a tired team kept letting them hang around the game. So that's my bad thing in the game is how the orders kept letting this team back into the game, which which they finally solved at the end of the second period there quite triumphantly um, with Dreisaitl's goal. And then um, Nick Bugstad uh, putting in that fantastic goal um, off an Ekholm pass uh, late in with one second left in the second. But my my other bad thing is we still don't I'm I'm still looking for information on this so hopefully it'll be nothing but Ryan McLeod went out with an injury didn't play or he went out and he didn't play the third period I don't know why he went out and there's no um, there's no information on Twitter right now so right. I can't tell you that but that's a bad thing if he's hurt he's a ve- he's a useful very useful player um, big and fast. And here's here's a funny comment from Twitter on Ryan McLeod. It's I don't know why they tweeted this just now, but they did. Someone called Adam um, at as now one one nine. Um, he's he he writes. My favorite Ryan McLeod fact is that he's listed as the same height and weight as Drysaddle, and then looks half the size. <laughs> I guess he's listed at six two 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 oh eight. Uh-huh. Um, McLeod. He says uh, he says McLeod looks like Nuge in my opinion, who's six feet one eighty, and that's kind of true. Like McLeod, if he is in fact listed as the same height and weight as Drysaddle, they, I mean, he must be carrying the weight somewhere else because Drysaddle, I mean, he looks like a, like a a block of, you know, he looks like a German oak tree, <laughs> and McLeod is not that. He's he, he does look t- kind of tall and slender, so. Uh, well, I showed a picture of Leon in, in uh, dress clothes or street clothes uh, during the game. Maybe it was at the uh, Junos or not quite sure where it was taken. And he had these tight-fitting pants on, and his legs looked like freaking toothpicks. Really? I'm astonished at how skinny Leon's legs were, like, you know, for how bulky and big of a guy he is. And, yeah. But he carries, like, most of his weight would be in his torso, you know, and and, uh, and his, it's not like he's got these big, powerful 
uh, thick legs. But he's got a huge back end. You know, I can protect the puck with his with his rear end with with the old with hockey ease. butt. Yeah. yeah, 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 and he uses it very, very effectively. But uh, the, I mean, these were these were you know just about painted on pants. So maybe they exaggerated it, but they really made him look like his legs were were uh, relatively scrawny to the rest of them. Let's put it that way. So Leon is listed at six two two oh eight. Yeah. And McLeod is listed at 6'2", 207, so they really are. Yeah. But they don't. Yeah. They sure don't look the same on the ice. That's no. I, I will, I will. McLeod's faster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true, too. Maybe it's just a different distribution. But, uh, I mean, yeah. Leon's pretty fast when he gets going, but uh, uh, McLeod is, you know, that's a, that's so central to this game. That uh, Anyway, it's, uh, yeah, kind of a scary night, David. They lost uh, McLeod during the game. They lost Hyman before the game, he he did not dress tonight. Zach and we Hyman. don't know why that is either. And nobody yeah. knows if he just he got a bug or if he was um, uh, he got some kind of a knock or uh, uh, I don't know. Maybe he went and got a test and it had a result he didn't want to hear or who knows, right? And uh, 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 it's uh, uh, guys get banged up. To me, I've been thinking um, Hyman might have been banged up for these maybe last eight or ten games that he was just sort of a little bit off, you know, good but not not overpowering the good like he had been. And also, Connor McDavid took two knocks in this game. One when Bouchard drilled him with the slap shot. Yeah. And the second time when he got folded over the boards mm. on an innocuous looking little check. A little bit after the... Uh, uh, a little bit after the uh, puck was gone, but nothing dirty, and he was wincing, and he had actually had his helmet right down on the boards at one point. Clearly, he was feeling that, so just something to watch. It wouldn't surprise me if he takes a maintenance day tomorrow at minimum. And then Derek Ryan also took a a real heavy blow and was in a little bit of tough shape, although he he uh, bounced back pretty fast. He's a he's a tough little guy, and. Uh, he uh, he hung in there, but it was a this was a game that kind of took a physical toll. Uh, it'll, it'll leave a mark. There'll be a few guys in the whirlpool. Daniel Nugent Bowman reports that Woodcroft said Zach Hyman was held up because he was quote dinged up. Uh huh. Um, okay. okay, I'm just seeing if I can find anything on McLeod here. Right. Nothing yet that I can find. So, yeah, nothing yet. Yeah. So anyway, we don't know what's going on there. Hopefully, it'll be nothing, and this will just be forgotten in a few seconds. Fingers mm-hmm. crossed. Fingers crossed. Good thing they got 22 men on the roster, is all I'll say, because uh, right now that you know they were able to uh, replace Hyman with another forward because all of the uh, moves at the trade deadline made room for one more guy, and he, uh, that guy, in fact, was uh, Nick Bukestad who scored tonight. Could they call up Raphael Lavoie if they had to? I guess Dylan Holloway's hurt. Yeah, you know, Holloway's hurt. Lavoie makes too much. He does, uh, eh? So, yeah, depending on... Uh, yeah, I don't think they have any real options of guys that they could send down. Unless they sent Broberg down, then it would work, because Broberg makes a little more well, than Lavoie same. does, I think. So, anyway, it's... it's I could see them doing that. If they needed to, they could do that. Uh, okay, numbers, Bruce. What's your number? Yeah, I'm going to go with the number uh, 129. And that is the number of points recorded this season by Connor McDavid. And I'll go back to 1997 because that gives us 25 years worth of hockey with the canceled one canceled season. And... Yes, let me bring it up. Connor McDavid has the most points of any NHLer in the last 25 years in one season. Wow. 129. He's now pulled ahead of the one great greatest season of the great Nikita Kucherov, who scored 128 uh, in 2018-19 to win the scoring title and the MVP award. Jeremy Jagger had 127 for Pittsburgh in 98-99. Joe Thornton had 125 uh, in the first year of the salary cap when he got traded from Boston to San Jose during the season and then won the MVP. That was pretty exceptional. And then uh, Conor McDavid is uh, 
Uh, last year's Connor McDavid with 123 is, completes the top five. And that's basically point scores in this century and going back a little bit further. The last guy to have more than that was, I think, 95, 96, and that would be Mario with uh, loading, loading, 161 points. Good, McDavid, he's got, uh, he's got but, 14 games left. So yeah. he's going to probably get about maybe 30 points. So he could get 100. Like, get pretty close. Yeah, he could, he could get he could get 160 um, if he gets hot. Mario did that in 70 games, by the way. Of course. A 2.30 points per game season. So that was 95, 96. And that was right at the tail end of the high scoring era. And at the time where traps, goaltending, defensive coaching, was really starting to uh, uh, turn the game the other way, and the numbers were were on their way down. Yeah, hockey became almost unwatchable for a few years. I found in, in the NHL. For so, the yeah, McDavid is at one point nine points per game. Um, so my number, Bruce, is um, Leon Draisaitl's uh, even strength goal scoring and power play goal scoring. He's got twenty seven on the power play this year and just 17 even strength at even strength. New, uh, McDavid has 35. Nugent Hopkins has 18. Drive settle has 17 and Hyman has 16. So Leon um, has been, his goal scoring rate isn't, it's obviously not terrible at even strength, but you know, um, for the orders to win in the playoffs, they need this Leon dry the one we saw tonight who at even strength is leading a line and getting it done. And it may be, um, a factor of chemistry at even strength. He's got to find the right line mates, the right kind of combination. And and it just hasn't really clicked with anybody, I don't think. Even McDavid, I mean, he's been okay with McDavid at even strength this year, but not fantastic. So if he can click with someone, and it's happened in the past, he's clicked with McDavid in the past, he's clicked on the dynamite line in the past, mm-hmm. he can find, he can make it work. And if he and he and he made it work, obviously in the 2017 playoffs when he first came alive as an elite hockey player in the NHL. Um, we need we're going to need to see that in the playoffs. I expect we are, and um, you know maybe it's going to be with Fogel and Nugent Hopkins. We'll see about that. They those are two highly complementary players to him. I think um, they can both get him at least Nugent Hopkins especially can get Leon the puck. To shoot, and Fogel's a big physical um, up and down winger, so it, that might work. Creates a little traffic in front, a little chaos, and Leon yeah. is the master at taking advantage of chaos. Yeah. So, anyway, Poss- two even strength goals for him tonight. I mean, it was twenty-seven and fifteen before this game. Correct. So I saw somebody was talking about this on Twitter the other day, and I can't remember the names involved, but I can remember <coughs> the numbers. Go figure. And they were doing power play goals minus even strength goals. And the guy that had the biggest gap was 16. He had 16 more power play goals and even strength goals. And there was, and of That's course, they the were NHL? all like big time power play snipers. And yeah. it's not a, it's not a record. It's just, you know, just, just sort of a, a, a triviality in one way. But uh, uh, it wasn't Tim Kerr, but it was some, you know, one of those guys was a big time sniper on the power play. And pretty good scorer at even strength. I mean, I think Chris Kreider was such a player last year. And, you know, they've, anyway, they've got, uh, 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 Leon was on that list, but he was around fifth. And now, you know, he will have dropped back in terms of, you know, he's only, he's only 10 different now, or he was 12 before. And hopefully, I mean, tonight, it, his even strength game was strong. I was very, very encouraged to, uh, to see him bring that because when Leon plays a good game at, at uh, a real strong game at five and five, Edmonton Oilers are awfully tough to beat. Indeed, because then you got McDavid on the other line, <laughs> and if he can get it going with Kane, right? Like because yeah. they had that tremendous chemistry in the playoffs last year, and Kane is Kane is not yet clicking. He and Yamamoto are are the two um, top guys that are, and Hyman's been in a bit of a slump now. Maybe listen, now we know why, right? We've all been saying for the last yeah. three, three weeks, Hyman slumping. Well, okay, now we hear, okay, he's not well enough to play. So, yeah, sit him out um, uh, for a game or two or three 
and let them get healthy. And the Oilers might have that luxury, although they're still scraping away for a playoff spot here, Bruce. So you just never know. Well, they are. And yet, uh, you've got, uh, I mean, tonight they brought it with all the lines. The uh, Derek Ryan McLeod Shore line scored the first goal. And the Bugstad uh, Coston uh, line with, uh, who the heck was the right winger on that line tonight? They were. Uh, they scored the fifth goal, and in between times, you've got Nuge scoring on the power play, dry saddle two at even strength. You know, and you're getting contributions from everywhere. And yeah, Janmark was with um, Janmark, right. So the orders have now moved into third place in the Pacific, again, ahead of the Kraken. Hallelujah. But they are just, the Kraken have a game in hand, and they're one point behind. So um, there's a, obviously a huge game coming up with the Kraken. So um, Saturday afternoon. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but Edmonton, yeah. I don't know. Like, do they, does it matter? As long as they make the playoffs, does it, does anything matter after that at this point? Like, the teams are so even. Um, yeah. You'd like a good matchup, but I mean, I'm thinking that from the standpoint of other Western Conference teams, teams that their idea of a good matchup probably isn't Edmonton. No, not at all. Because of the, all the firepower on uh, on this team and then the, uh, uh, you know, the potential of it, certainly. But uh, it's... Um, as long as the Avs don't win the other division, because if the Oilers are the wild card team, would they play the winner of the Central? The second wild card team, like the eighth place team... They play <clears throat> the division champion that had the most points. I see. So that, you know, if you finish eighth in the division, you basically will play the first seed. And I you finish see. Seventh, that could be you'll Vegas. play the other division winner. And then two two meets three in each conference. Yeah. So, or in each, sorry, in each division. Well, Seattle or LA would be tough teams to play against, too, because they're both big physical hockey teams. So, you know. Yeah, there's it's it's all it's it's six of one, half a dozen of the the one team you don't want to play in the first round is the Avs, probably, yeah. and and it doesn't look that's probably one of the least likely things that could happen. Although it could still happen, the Avs are seven points behind Dallas, mm-hmm. and they have got three games in hand. So you never know. The Avs are a hell of a hockey team, and uh, are the team I think is still the team to beat. Obviously, in the Western Conference, you know, despite a fairly mediocre regular season here. Rash of injuries. Yeah. Well, and Bruce, let's see. another one. Hey, Lekin and got hurt last night, so he's out for a while. And that's a big player for them. Oh, he really is. Yeah. Four to six oh. weeks, so it'll take him into the first round. Okay. All right, Bruce. Let's leave it there. Thanks for talking tonight. Thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.